Hi friends, so today I'll be talking on this very brief topic, uh, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, which was previously called hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. So now the nomenclature is changed to HHS, which is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. So I'm sure most intensivists will be treating this on a regular basis. So what is just give you a brief overview. So I wish to acknowledge my colleague Gambrita who prepared the content for this. So let's look into, maybe it will only take 10 minutes this talk. So the definition is with the word hyperosmolar hyperglycemic coma. So all these three constitute the whole definition. So one of the criteria is they should have hyperglycemia. So blood sugar levels in HHS is typically much more elevated than diabetic ketoacidosis. So one of the sister concern of this condition is diabetic ketoacidosis. So we need to delineate the difference in DKA and hyperosmolar coma. So in hyperosmolar coma or HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar coma, which I'll be calling as HHS, sugar levels are much higher than in DKA. So it is typically more than 600 milligram per deciliter. And they'll have dehydration. Profound dehydration is something which is unique component of HHS. And with it, they'll have hyperosmolality and the hyperosmolality is much higher than in DKA. It is more than 320 milliosmoles and there is no DKA in this. So this, so within the nomenclature of HHS is the definition. So high sugar, high osmolality, dehydration and no DKA. So some of the key differences as to how HHS is different from DKA. In DKA, there is no insulin in the body, but in HHS, there is some residual insulin or small amount of insulin is present and the counter regulatory hormone that gets manifested in HHS is much higher than in DKA. So there are increased levels of counter regulatory hormones that are present in HHS and in HHS acute kidney injury or the renal dysfunction is more strikingly present than in DKA. DKA they may not have typically a severe acute kidney injury but in HHS, more renal dysfunction may be present. So this is these are some of the delineating features between HHS and DKA. And HHS tend to occur in older age, and the mortality is much higher in HHS than in DKA. And mortality is put at anywhere between 5 to 20%. So as the name suggests, it's a hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. Before, it used to be called hyperosmolar non-ketotic coma. So the physical examination, the, the striking clinical feature is they'll have altered mental status or obtundation. And they can have a lot of hemodynamic instability in HSS as compared to DKA. So hypotension may be present and severe tachycardia may be present. And typically in DKA, you would have patients with vomiting and abdominal pain. Those features are typically absent in HSS. So when we look at the pathophysiology of HSS, uh, so there are three components that are needed for HHS to happen. So there has to be, there almost always there is a trigger which induces HHS. And we'll talk about what are all the triggers. So there is an inciting event or a trigger that leads to HHS. Along with it, there is a reduction in the baseline insulin within the body. Then there is profound uh, regulatory, counter-regulatory hormones, or there can be, you can call it as there is more of cytokine storm or there is more of inflammatory process or there is more of stress response, which lead to increased levels of counter-regulatory hormones in HHS. So all these three together, trigger with low insulin and in increase in the counter-regulatory hormones, lead to increased production of gluconeogenic enzymes. As the name sounds, these enzymes lead to increased production of glucose in the body. So there is increased glycolysis. So th this increase in the gluconeogenic enzymes lead to increased breakdown of glycogen to glucose, and there is redu reduced peripheral utilization of glucose. So reduced glucose utilization is there. And there is increased production of glucose by gluconeogenesis. So these are the three things that get activated with increase in the gluconeogenic enzyme. So there is increased glycogenolysis and increased gluconeogenesis. And there is reduced glucose utilization. All this lead to hyperglycemia. And because there is increase in the hyperglycemia, it acts as an osmotic diuresis. So they pass a lot of urine. And because there is osmotic diuresis and they pass out a lot of liquid in the urine, there is profound dehydration that sets in. 
and with dehydration there's a lot of electrolyte abnormalities and this leads to increase in the osmolality and leads to hhs hyperosmolar hyperglycemic coma or hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state so and as i said the insulin some baseline levels of insulin are present it is not like insulin is absolutely absent as in dka and there is increase in the hypersensitive lipase because there is this baseline insulin present and there is increase in the lipase ketogenesis does not happen that's why we don't see keto acids in hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state or hhs so that is the reason we don't see ketones which is otherwise seen in dka so this is in brief about the pathogenesis or pathophysiology so for all the trainees you can remember this picture and this can be a common exam for dnbs or uh, any other exam so it is good to simplify the whole pathogenesis and keep this in back of your mind so we'll talk about triggers or hhs as i said almost always there is a trigger in hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state the commonest trigger as you would all know is infection that's why we do it is appropriate to give initial antibiotics and then later on deescalate because 40 to 60 percent of the time infection is the trigger or underlying sepsis so in icu typically someone who comes with hhs you would suspect sepsis and you have to obviously give targeted antibiotic uh, therapy based on the possible source that you have in mind so 40 to 60 percent of the time infection is the cause for trigger and 60% uh, of the time, pneumonia is the commonest cause of uh, infection that leads to a uh, trigger, that, that is the common cause of trigger in HHS. And 16% of the time, it is uh, UTI. So this is as per some of the reference articles. So these are some of the triggers that one would have. And, uh, sorry. and the second commonest risk for uh, HHS is non-adherence to uh, diabetic drugs or uh, insulin and so on and so forth. So the commonest is infection, pneumonia is common, followed by UTI and non-adherence to medication. So there is a whole list of triggers. So any sort of a condition that mandates patient to be admitted in ICU can be a trigger. So just put it in a pictorial for, uh, format. So any stroke or seizure is a risk for uh, HHS. So acute myocardial, so anyone comes with DKA, or more so HHS, one has to keep in mind the possible of acute coronary event because they have lost a lot of fluid. Blood would be in a hypercoagulable state. So it is always prudent that you look for any cardiac cause. So MIs are one of the inciting factor for HHS. Or GI bleeds is also a trigger. And any major surgery, post-surgical or alcohol or pulmonary embolism or venous thromboembolism and acute or chronic pancreatitis and acute kidney injury. So any of these typical ICU conditions, which any of our trainees would be seeing, are risk for pushing someone into HHS. And there are certain drugs touted to be as a risk for HHS. So any, any patient who is on psychiatric medication, steroids is dead, one of the trigger for HHS, beta blockers, diuretics, and chemotherapy. So, so you can sort of keep this picture in your mind. So any ICU patient would possibly have any of one or two of these conditions and all these are triggers for HHS. So we'll just look into what are the typical lab values that we see in HHS, which is uniquely different to DKA. So you don't need to memorize this. So any patient who comes to ICU, what would you do? You would do a glucose and you would do an ABG. So what are the features? So glucose, as I said, in HHS, remember 600 and more will be HSS. In DKA, it will be around 250 to 600 milligram and not very high blood sugar level. And you would look at ABG next. So pH in DKA, as the name sounds, you will have acidemia, 6.8 or pH will be low. But in HHS, the pH will be normal. And then next thing you look at is CO2 in ABG because in DKA, there'll be more tachypnea, CO2 will be low, but in HHS, CO2 can be normal. And bicarbonate, as the name sounds, acidosis. The next thing you'll see in ABG is bicarbonate. It will be less in DKA and it will be more in HHS. So quite intuitive. Uh, so any patient in ICU, you would do a blood gas, look into all this to delineate and differentiate between DKA. Anion gap will be high in DKA. Why it will be high? Because of accumulation of keto acids, beta hydroxy, butyric acid, and astroacetic acid, which is not the case in HHS, where ion gap will be normal or slightly high. 
and as the name sounds osmolality we did discuss it will be much higher in hhs so osmolality is 300 to 320 in dkr range but in hhs it is much more higher and as i said ketones are present urinary ketones is what we do here in india so that is there in dkr in hhs it may be absent some occasionally it can be present also but generally it will be absent so it's very simple. You don't need to buy at this table. So you will look at ABG and go one by one and you know what are the differences between DK and HHS. With regards to electrolytes, uh, serum sodium will be little less in DK. In HHS, it will be either normal sodium or sometimes it can be even high because there's a lot of water content that is lost. Potassium in DK can be normal or high. It will be normal in HHS. Magnesium, phosphorus will be normal. So one would be wondering are these normal or should it be low? It will be normal, but once you start insulin as a therapy, then this magnesium will come down, potassium will come down, and phosphorus will come down, which will talk, which has to be replenished. And one of the common questions that we ask in exams in IDCCM or any other exam you would be taking is, is this sodium in HHS 135 truly reflective of body sodium or is it high? So the answer is, it will be high. So creatinine as a DKA, it will be mild increase. In HHS, generally renal dysfunction will be present. It will be moderately high. So the correction for the sodium, if it is 135 in HHS, you have to correct for that because the sodium will be much higher. So the formula which we typically ask in exam when we in OSCEs. So for every 100 milligram deciliter increase in blood sugar level, there will be, you have to add 1.6 milli equivalents of sodium. So this is the normal thing we ask. But when we are correcting the reduction for every 100 reduction in blood sugar level, sodium comes down by little more. It's 2.4 milligrams, which, which is something which all trainees should bear in mind. So we'll just move on to treatment. So the main peanuts of treatment, either in DKA or hyperosmolar state, hyperglycemic is fluid. Fluid is the mainstay in both DKA and HHS. Since we are talking about HHS, fluids become the mainstay followed by insulin and followed by correction of the underlying cause and correction of electrolytes. So what are the choice of fluids? So the initial choice is saline or ringer lactate is the choice of fluid. Initially, because they have a cumulative deficit of up to 10 to 12 liters of fluid deficit will be there in a patient with hyperosmolar state, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar. So two to three liters uh, over 1 to 3 hours is given, so 10 to 20 ml per kg per hour. So if you are dealing with a 60 kg individual, you have to give 1.2 liters per hour. At least for 2 to 3 hours, we have to replenish that. After that, you will change it to half normal saline or 0.45% saline at 250 to 500 ml per hour. Basically, you have the infusion. And later on, you'll, we need to keep checking blood sugar level every hour. Once it comes down to less than 250, I'm sure most trainees would be practicing this. One would start 5% dextrose or plus or minus ringer lactate at 150 to 250 ml per hour with replenishment of all electrolytes. So the key component in this is you, uh, the key message is keep monitoring blood sugar level every hour and electrolyte fourth hourly at least to see how they are changing and replenish these salts. But the key aspect is to the goal of your therapy is to replenish the fluid deficit in 24 hours. So if the serum sodium is normal or high, which means if it is normal or high, obviously you will have to calculate the corrected serum sodium. So if it is 135, it will be more than that based on the sugars. So it is desirable you use half normal saline at that point of time, half saline. If serum sodium is less than 135 milli equivalents, then you can use 0.9% saline. So the goal of the therapy is to replenish the fluid deficit within 24 hours in HHS, hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. And as I said, uh, for as you keep correcting with insulin, for every 100 reduce, reduction in the blood sugar level, uh, you have to uh, correct your sodium with 2.4 milli equivalent. So when, it is, when blood sugar level is high, so you have to add 1.6, but when you're correcting, the fall in sodium is by 2.4 milli equivalent. So that is something for all trainees to remember. So just to give a brief, uh, so in ICU, apart from saline and half saline, we have balanced solution. So you can utilize balanced solution also. As you see, the sodium content in 0.9% is 154. So once you have a very high sodium, if you're not able to use 
0.9 percent saline you can think of using rl or plasma light rl definitely because sodium is much lesser rather than using half normal saline initially so which means to say in our practice we tend to use more of rl so rl is safe enough so you can use more of rl if you want to avoid too much of sodium loading in this patient this is just a table to indicate that sodium levels are much lesser in rl or plasma light as compared to 0.9 percent saline so now coming to insulin so the the key aspect of the whole treatment is to administer fluid replenish fluid fluid deficit within 24 hours and you have to give at least initially 2 to 3 hours or up to 3 to 4 hours i would say give minimum of more than 1 to 1.2 liters because it is it is 20 ml per kg in a 60 kg will be around 1.2 to 1.5 liters per hour for 3 to 4 hours then reduce to half with half normal saline and then keep monitoring electrolytes and titrate uh, fluid replenishment accordingly. So insulin, the standard is to use short-acting regular insulin like Acropid or any of those uh, short-acting insulin at 0.1 unit per kg. So if it is 60 kg, you will use 6 units to start with and then keep cranking it up to reduce the blood sugar level. So you give bolus followed by 0 0.1 unit per kg per hour as an infusion. Start at 6 and increase it to 12 units and so on. So you keep increasing by 0.1 units. So, uh, so you have to increase by two to three fold until we see the blood sugar level drop by 50 to 75 milligrams per deciliter. So once the blood sugar level comes to less than 250 milligram, I think most of the trainees would know, you have to start 5% dextrose with insulin and reduce the insulin dose by 0.02 to 0.1 units. How you have increased every 0.1 unit per kg per hour to reduce the blood sugar level. Once it comes to less than 250, you start reducing the insulin infusion also by 0.1 unit per kg per hour. So it's the key component of managing this HHS or DKA, as you would all know, is to keep monitoring blood sugar level at least every hourly. And in our practice, we do electrolyte scores hourly until we have an absolute control over potassium, magnesium. So the keep Please keep an eye on potassium levels because once we start administering insulin, potassium is pushed back into the cells and uh, potassium levels start coming down and magnesium levels start coming down and phosphorus levels start coming down and all these needs to be replenished. So we have to keep an eye on these levels and replenish them accordingly. So whilst you are doing this, it is important to know the plasma osmolality and monitor osmolality. So we ask this in exam. Many of the trainees would not even tell us the formula. So it's a simple thing. So we can calculate the plasma osmolality and keep monitoring it, how it is progressing after you have ad uh, administering fluids and insulin. So 2 into sodium plus glucose by 18 plus blood urea divided by 2. So very easy formula. So the change in plasma osmolality is looked at as a response to treatment. So the osmolality should start coming down by 3 to 8 milliosmoles per kg. Initially, it it used to be 3 milliosmoles, but then the UK guidelines has increased up to 8 milliosmoles per kg per hour could be reduced as you keep treating with fluids. So if plasma osmolality starts increasing, then you have to switch over from saline to half, half saline or 0.45% saline. And if there is a rapid reduction in osmolality of more than 8 milliosmoles, then you have to move to saline or, or hold this half saline because that would be dropping the osmolality at a much faster level. So, so that's about in brief about HHS. So the key components, it's a very simple topic, but nevertheless, it's a very important uh, sort of a clinical condition that we see. And every intensivist should have a clarity on the management principles. So the key components are the fluid administration with monitoring of osmolality as a response to the therapy with insulin and treatment of the underlying cause and recognizing the trigger and addressing the trigger appropriately. So thank you. Thank you one and all. You can visit my website www.drpagitanga.com to rehear to this link.